Welcome back to ECE 442-542. We'll start with some announcements. Homework number five is already out, so that coming soon is now, it is happening, and it's due on April 1st, and that's not an April Fool's <laughs> joke. It is due on the 1st of April. Exam number three, just to keep you thinking about your next scheduled appointment to come to class if you're not here today is April 10th that's on a Wednesday the project you need to be thinking about that and getting started on that thought process a week from today I'm actually going to be somewhere else so please don't come to this room we will I will try to make things available to you on the web on D2L but we won't have a on-campus meeting a week from today on the I hope that dates right the 25th of March and there will be no office hours on that date which immediately precede the class that won't happen either in this room what I thought we would do today is try to get reoriented or orient ourselves as to where we are and where we're going in the remainder of the class so where have we been? We've been talking about modeling and Z-transforms. That we'll spend a few minutes on. That was the material from exams one and two. Where are we going? Really to now start manipulating those systems. How do we control them to behave the way that we want those systems now to behave? And that's the remainder of the class. But before actually we get to controller design, we need to figure out how do we want the system to behave? How do we know where we're going if we don't know how to make the system behave? And that's what we're going to talk about is what we will call performance specifications. How do we create performance specifications or if we're handed performance specifications, how do we create regions in the complex z-plane that we actually want our closed loop poles to live? We know that the dynamics of our system are influenced by the locations of these complex poles in the z-plane. Now we need to know where are those dominant poles going to be located. The fast ones we could all put really close to the origin and we'll have then these dominant poles that govern the behavior of the overall closed loop transfer function. That's kind of the thought process. And we'll try to convert those discrete time performance specifications into z-plane pole locations or desired transfer functions but before we do that let's connect it to maybe something you've already seen which is continuous time or analog performance specifications this s-plane pole locations regions in the s-plane in this class I think I said before we have two complex planes an s-plane and a z-plane and we, need to, and we need to understand that connection. How are the S-plane poles related to the Z-plane poles, et cetera, or these analog control specs, how do those get mapped into discrete time specifications? Here's a little bit more about where we have been just to remind us of the, the expanse that we've covered. We've talked about difference equations and transfer functions. That's the time domain and the frequency domain. We learned how to solve those difference equations, either whether those are homogeneous or natural solutions, or if they are forced by some excitation or exciting force. We hopefully are a little bit more comfortable with this notion of how fast do we sample what's our sampling period and that's just a rule of thumb and I didn't see any thumbs go up on the exam but I think you were using most everyone did get that formula correct when they needed it on the exam exam number two which says that the sampling frequency in radians per second is 30 times the fastest frequency in your analog system in radians per second or if you need it in terms of a sample period that omega sub s is 2 pi over capital T. We've talked about the Z transform 
the S plane to Z plane mapping relationship, this advance Z, this advance of one sample period is the same or equivalent to E to the ST in the S domain or S plane. We've been able to do inverse Z transforms and to obtain a unique answer we needed both the transform expression and the region of convergence. Then we talked about the region of convergence and we had three generic patterns to deal with. There's one on the left where the region of convergence is going out to infinity and it may or may not include infinity. We had another region that was a disk inside the smallest radius of a pole in our Z plane and then we had an annular region that could have pole that does have poles inside and outside that region of convergence. For the one on the left, what did that correspond to in terms of domain over which the time sequences are defined? So on the left hand side, what was N? N was, was it negative infinity to infinity? Was it non-negative? Was it negative? Which of those was it? Do I now need to see thumbs? I didn't say how to show me a thumb, did I? <clears throat> That's the causal, correct? When it's going off to infinity, this corresponded to a causal waveform. With the inner disk, that was just the opposite. That's the anti-causal or non-causal waveform and the one with the annular is two-sided. We then talked about discrete equivalence and we could talk about that in terms of time domain discrete equivalence or frequency domain discrete equivalence, state space representations or transfer function based discrete equivalence and we had different varieties of those discrete equivalents. We had the zero order hold equivalent which you could find different ways and on the exam I saw some valid ways to connect those two ways but they're a little bit tedious if you start doing that sometimes but it can be done but you now have the frequency domain version and the time domain version of those zero order hold equivalents. Another discrete equivalent was numerical integration. Forward, backward, trapezoid, where trapezoid, maybe somebody calls it bilinear, maybe they call it Tustin, and the pole zero mapping. And I wanted to see if everyone was reading the exam questions properly and not just re producing what had been done on previous exams, I said, okay, I want a certain pole zero excess in the discrete time transfer function. And that corresponds to how many of these Z plus one factors are included in the numerator or not included in the numerator in your pole zero mapping. And that, the reason for that might be in implementation concerns. If you definitely want a one sample period delay between the input and the output of this transfer function, you may want to have a pole zero excess of one in your transform in the Z domain. That's where we've been. Where are we going? It can all be diagrammed in one picture. <laughs> This is where we're going. We want to figure out how do we design this controller block, capital C of Z. And that arises in this closed loop scenario. We have our plant or our system G of S, which could be an analog plant or it might be a generically discrete plant. We could relate or replace all three of those blocks in the forward path 
in, on the right with just one block and say that's g of z. Now somebody hands you a g of z and they say control that system. If somebody wants that system controlled, it might be a good idea to determine how do you want it to behave. And that's what we need to learn about, which is this capital T sub C of Z, this closed loop transfer function. How do we really want that closed loop transfer function to behave? Or what do we want it to look like in terms of its properties, its specifications, its characteristics. What do we want capital T sub C of Z to look like? And that's really what we will start talking about after we start learning about these performance specifications. That will guide us into where we might want these closed loop poles to be located. That will be then a part of, if not all of, our denominator in T sub C of Z, the desired closed loop transfer function. And that's what we still need. We still need to determine how do we create this desired closed loop transfer function, T sub C of Z, and can we gain some insight into that? And the insight that we want is going to be based on or will depend on performance specifications. If somebody now says they want a particular settling time or they want a percent overshoot to be so much or they want a peak time to be a certain number of sample periods, how do you accomplish that? That's why we need to learn about the performance that we need to be coming from T sub C of S and how do we now create those? I apologize that I'm scrolling through this, but we have a lot to get through. And I know that you have access. You can now figure out how much space you need to leave in your notes or how many pages to leave. And you can go back and fill those in based on the notes that will be available to you on D2L. Of course, if you're at home watching this on quadruple speed, I guess you're still probably really trying to, the audio is fine, it's just the video that's going to be, so now we love it. Lessons learned, no. So how do we create these performance specifications? What are the, what's the continuous time system that we can start thinking about and we usually talk about or describe these performance specifications for a second order under damped system. And if that's the case, what's this T of S look like for the analog system? We can write it a couple of different ways. We could write it in terms of a natural frequency, omega sub n, and to obtain a DC gain that's one, we'll square that numerator value for omega sub n, and then the denominator is written in terms of that natural frequency and a zeta value, which we'll call the damping ratio zeta. In this form, then, the transfer function, the ideal trans second order under damped second order system is now omega sub n squared over s squared plus two zeta omega sub n s plus omega sub n squared. If you wanted to write it in terms of real and imaginary components of the closed loop poles, that you now have two closed loop poles in the denominator, and if the real part, if you're in the left half plane, a distance of minus sigma, you could also write that as s plus sigma squared plus the imaginary component of those complex poles omega sub d, and that will be squared. To obtain a DC gain of one, the numerator would need to be omega sub n squared, or that's also sigma squared plus omega sub d squared. 
those two descriptions of this this underdamped second order transfer function we can put now into the complex S plane with some labeling. Suppose that our poles are complex and let's just give them and I would have its conjugate down there associated with that we could say that they're a certain distance away from the complex plane's origin and this is now the S plane and that's a terrible circle but you can draw a better circle wow that one's not even gonna be that X is supposed to be the conjugate so obviously I need to redraw that if my circle was somewhat accurate the distance that pole is away from the origin and maybe I can make that a different dashed line that's now the natural frequency that's omega sub n the distance that pole is into the left half plane in the horizontal direction is the damping or sigma or that's now zeta omega sub n where this pole s is now at minus sigma plus j omega sub d this horizontal distance I'm sorry this vertical distance is now j omega sub d one more piece of information we might talk about a angle theta and that angle theta is not going to be the same as the angle theta sub d in the complex z plane so we'll have two thetas one will be theta and one will be theta sub d maybe theta discrete is a way to think of it where this these poles and I'll just deal with the pole in the second quadrant is now s minus sigma plus j omega sub d or we could write that s in terms of zeta and omega sub n as minus zeta omega sub n plus j omega sub n square root of 1 minus zeta squared and by comparison of those two expressions we can see that zeta omega sub n is sigma and this weighted natural frequency where it's weighted by the square root of 1 minus zeta sub 1 minus zeta squared is the damped frequency omega sub d this damping ratio that we now have in play on this diagram actually varies between 0 and 1 for poles that are a distance omega sub n away from the origin when zeta when we have no damping when zeta is equal to zero we're right on the imaginary axis we're right up there for the pole that's a terrible circle I apologize that's supposed to be a circle and this point would be when we were critically damped or when zeta is equal to one if we rotated that angle and now theta is zero now we have a zeta value of 1. Those are the points and the labels associated with a underdamped complex set of poles in the S plane for a continuous time system. And let's now try to fill in the terminology that I was using. relative to those variables sigma which is also zeta omega sub n or the damping ratio times the natural frequency is what we will call the damping zeta which we can find or have various ways of writing that's actually the real part of that pole's location over 
the magnitude of that pole location or the natural frequency or this is now sigma and now I should say it's really sort of the magnitude of the real part sigma over s or this is now zeta omega sub n over omega sub n which is zeta and that's the damping ratio. The natural frequency omega sub n is really just the distance from the origin to that complex pole location or that's the hypotenuse. That's our natural frequency. That's the hypotenuse of this right triangle formed by sigma and omega sub d. And finally, the other variable that we have created is omega sub d. That's the natural frequency that's been damped by the damping ratio, a, a particular relationship, which is the square root of 1 minus zeta squared, and we call that the damped frequency of oscillation. Or just the damped frequency. That's these pole locations and what we want to do is feel comfortable with if somebody now moves those poles around what would that correspond to in the time domain step response for an underdamped system. Let's now look at the step response. In terms of some of those parameters. And if I was challenged to draw a circle, I'm really going to be challenged now. But let's see how, what I can do. Suppose that's now a damped step response of a second order system. We can identify several points on that curve. We can, multi or we can identify the time that the waveform peaks, which I'll call T sub P, that's the peak time. And where it peaks, we also, if we evaluated the expression for the output Y at the time that it peaked T sub P, that would be its maximum value and we'll call that Y sub max. Let's assume that it now goes to that particular value. Let's say this is now our final value. Here is y of t. And we can draw a tube that the response gets into and does not leave. And we can make that tube as big as we want. But for this class, let's go ahead and just make that a tube that's 1% of the final value. So this is now our 1% tube. And this step response is for our second order under damped system. Once we get into that tube and don't leave, that time is now our 1% settling time. And we might call that time value T subsettle. And we've just agreed that we'll approximate that to be 5 time constants, 5 tau. which really just means that if we had an exponential waveform that had a time constant of tau, we could write it as e to the minus t over tau.
But if we evaluate that at five time constants, that says that we're evaluating that when t, the time, is actually five tau. And this is the approximation that we're making. We're saying that's what we're assuming is 0.01. It's not quite. It's actually a little bit less than that. It's 0.006. Seven. That's the approximation, but we're just saying for purposes of design, let's just say five time constants is how far we need to go in time to get within 1% of our final value. And that will be our settling time. Let's now try to translate or connect those time domain specifications into particular values or locations in the complex S-plane. And that's what we are calling these performance specifications. Suppose now we start with maybe the most transparent, and that's the 1% settling time, or the most immediate one. That might be one of your very first performance specifications is how fast does it take to settle? Yes? So the final value that the output expression, in general, it's based on this transfer function description. The final value should be 1. Because now if I inject a unit step, the final value y, the DC gain of those two transfer functions are actually equal to 1. What I'm doing now is I'm drawing that y of t a little bit more generically and just saying, oh, I'm allowing for some arbitrary gain that I'm calling a. And if that's the case, and maybe I don't know that, maybe I don't care what the DC gain is, I need to now know the final value and compare that to y max so that I can actually get a relationship between the peak and the final value, and that will be my percent overshoot, which I'm going to get to in a minute. And that percent overshoot specification is related to the damping ratio zeta. So now I'm writing it more generically so that I don't always just assume that if you're given a step response and somebody goes, wait a minute, this step response is settling or its final value is 2.67. I don't know, Tharp didn't tell us how to find the percent overshoot when it's something other than 1. So I don't want to be known for that. So we're saying, oh, it's y final value. That's why I'm saying that it's now, is that answering your question? Yes, so now the final value, the question is, what is the final value? You could apply the final value theorem in a Laplace transform setting and say, where do I actually end up at t equal to infinity? What we are saying is, effectively, t settle is infinity. But in, when we need to actually find it, we would want to obtain a pretty accurate value for y final value. We've reached or we've gone inside the tube and now what we want to do is connect this settling time specification in time to a location in the complex S plane. Or we now have T settle. We said was 5 tau, but the time constant tau is reciprocally related to the sigma or the damping. If you go back to 
e to the minus t over tau, that's also equally written, that particular factor in our expression, as e to the minus sigma t. Sigma and tau are reciprocally related, or we can now write this as 5 over sigma. Meaning, if somebody now gives us the settling time that they want, that implies a particular distance into the complex s-plane, sigma. We can solve this for sigma. We can say sigma is now 5 divided by t settle. And I guess I, in my notes I said down here e to the minus t over tau is e to the minus sigma t, which is why we can say that sigma is reciprocally related to tau. Now if somebody says I want a settling time of 5 seconds, then we know that sigma needs to be at minus 1, the real part of our complex plane. Drawing that, here's the real part of S. This is the S plane. Here's the imaginary part of S. And now let me draw a couple of different locations. Suppose that I have poles here and maybe I have other poles that are here. And associated with this set, I now say that those are a distance sigma sub 1 into the complex S plane and this other set Let me say they are a distance sigma sub 2 into the complex S plane. Here's the question. Sigma sub 2 produces a blank system response than sigma sub 1. And now I need to f you to fill in the blank. Sigma sub 2 produces a slower system response than sigma sub 1, or sigma sub 2 produces a faster system response than sigma sub 1. Let's say faster is a thumbs up, slower is a thumbs down. And I want you to answer that based on the discussion. See if, it, if everyone is following what I'm trying to say by indicating a thumb at the count of three. Up is faster, down is slower. Ready? One, two, three. So we're seeing a lot of thumbs up, which is a good sign for this. We need sigma sub two, which is further into the left half plane, and just put some numbers on this. You could say sigma sub 1 is 1 and sigma sub 2 is 10. Now you're comparing e to the minus t to e to the minus 10t. And e to the minus 10t is an exponential that goes much quicker than e to the minus t. Or this is now sigma sub 2 produces a faster system response than sigma sub 1. And that means then if somebody now gives you a settling time, then that translates into a sigma, a location in the left half plane of the complex S plane. If somebody gives you a settling time, you can now say, oh, what vertical line am I on? You can be anywhere on that vertical line. You just need to be on that vertical line or to the left to obtain a T settle of that amount or smaller. And usually you want to err on the side of being faster than what somebody specifies. Not tremendously faster, but a maybe a little bit faster.
That's the first settling time specification for this underdamped continuous time waveform. The second one is percent overshoot. And the percent overshoot is now connected to the maximum peak value of y and its final value. Or we now have y when it peaked, that's y max, minus its final value divided by its final value times 100%. And a lot of times students put the max value in the denominator. That's not going to give you the percent overshoot. This is now y max. So if you came to class today and you're not watching this at quadruple speed, you may be heard that y max minus y final value divided by y mi final value times 100%. That gives you the percent overshoot. That'll give you a number. Maybe it's 20%. Maybe it's 10%. But if you now were to go back and find an equation for y for an underdamped second order system for a step response, you'll see that the percent overshoot in terms of zeta, the damping ratio, is 100 e to the minus zeta pi over the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. Maybe I'll let you derive that at home or find that. But that's just based on a second order underdamped response in terms of zeta. If percent overshoot is a number and you don't know zeta, you can now solve this equation for zeta. And doing that, you will find that zeta now becomes the following expression. It's the natural log of the percent overshoot in percent divided by 100, square that, divide by pi squared, which we missed pi day, I guess, last week. We just zipped right by it after the exam, right? So now pi, pi squared, plus natural log of percent overshoot over 100 squared. And the magic thing that you can't remember is to take the square root of that. That will now give you the damping ratio. If somebody hands you a percent overshoot of 10%, now you take the natural log of 0.1, square it, keep that in memory, divide that by pi squared. What is pi squared roughly? In round numbers, 10. So now you have 10 plus the natural log of 0.1 squared and take the square root of that. That will give you a zeta value. If you plotted those relationships on a two-dimensional sketch where the y-axis is now percent overshoot and the horizontal axis is zeta, you will obtain a curve. And if you wanted to, you could bring this curve into the exam and not have to do these calculations. You'd want to have the curve a little bit more accurately depicted than what I've drawn here. But now if somebody said, oh, I have a 50% overshoot, that would now roughly correspond to a zeta value of 0.2. Now use your imagination on these lines. Suppose that now this is a 10% overshoot then that in the actual relationship corresponds to a zeta value of 0.6. This diagram's not drawn right, but it's labeled right. And if you had a 5% overshoot, that was supposed to be half of 10, and this isn't supposed to go very far out because this is supposed to be 0.7. Like I said, it's not drawn accurately, but it's labeled accurately. If somebody now says, oh, I have a 5% overshoot specification, then you need a zeta value, a damping ratio of 
If they say I want a 10%, now your zeta value is 0.6. And you can now relate those to what happens in the complex S plane. What happens when you have no damping? According to this plot, if my sketch was somewhat better, it never really you can't calculate the percent overshoot for this ideal second order curve. So on this plot we're now going to sketch this curve and how far away are we on this curve? Let me draw a couple of points. And both of those are the same distance away from the origin. So this distance is omega sub n, as is this distance. But what differs is their real and imaginary components. Here, we could say that this is now a zeta 1 omega sub n where this is now a zeta 1 value and this which I'll relate that to theta in a minute and now this particular real part is zeta sub 2 omega sub n And what's happening to the percent overshoot? If I wanted to say, I want you to tell me what happens to the percent overshoot, or if the percent overshoot is decreasing, here is a value of zeta equals zero, here is a value of zeta equal one. This is now a zeta value of, let's say, zeta sub two. I can now associate this with an angle theta 1 and this with an angle of theta sub 2. And for those particular angles if I said cosine of theta in terms of a generic zeta and omega sub n, cosine of theta is just the real component over the hypotenuse, so that's now zeta omega sub n over omega sub n, or that's now zeta. Or if somebody gave you a theta, or a, if somebody gave you a theta, you could calculate zeta. If somebody gave you a zeta, you could calculate theta. If they give you a percent overshoot, you can now find zeta you can inverse cosine that zeta to find theta in this S plane. Now I have an arrow. I'm going from zeta equal zero somewhere either from zeta equal to one to zeta equal to zero or from zeta equal zero to zeta equal to one to make a decreasing percent overshoot. Where do I put the arrow if I want decreasing percent overshoot indicated by the value of zeta or that angle of theta? Do I want it going towards the real axis or towards the imaginary axis, the arrowhead that I want to label that line with? If I want a decreasing percent overshoot, what do I want theta to be doing? Do I want theta to be getting smaller or bigger? I need it to be smaller in angle, so a decreasing percent overshoot is actually going to say you want to be
if somebody says I want a certain omega sub n then you now decrease that angle theta or make it smaller to obtain a decreasing percent overshoot. I know that you came here today hoping to have a nursery rhyme so let's talk about a nursery rhyme. I have to wake you up, right? So now a nice value of zeta, if somebody said give me a zeta, please just give me a zeta, hand me a zeta, I would give them a zeta of 0.7. That's a nice trade-off between percent overshoot and speed of response. So this is a nice value And what does that correspond to in terms of theta? If I said the inverse cosine of 0.7, 07, inverse cosine of 0.7 is 45 degrees. And what did I say corresponded percent overshoot wise to a zeta of 0.7? 5%. So now this zeta of 0.7 gives us a 5% overshoot, which isn't a big overshoot. And it allows us to get up to our peak value rather rapidly. So this is the Goldilocks value of zeta. There's our nursery rhyme or something that makes you feel warm and fuzzy. Zeta of 0.7. But in general if somebody now says oh somebody is now giving me a percent overshoot they specify a percent overshoot that means that you can now determine what zeta is. What's the damping ratio? And I think we've already answered this, but theta sub 2 produces blank overshoot than theta 1. In this diagram, theta sub 2 produces more or less overshoot than theta sub 1. And now you just have to look at my arrow that I've already put on the diagram, right? This now says that theta sub 2 produces less overshoot than theta sub 1. So far we have found a vertical line that we need to be on or to the left of. We found an angle that we might like to be relative to our percent overshoot. Now let's do one more which is the peak time. And for a second order under damp system that's actually related to the imaginary component of that complex Pole. It's pi over omega sub d. And if somebody gives you the peak time, you can now solve for omega sub d. That's pi over t sub p. Again, in the complex plane, S plane, we could now talk about two different poles. They're the same distance away from the vertical axis, but their vertical distance or their imaginary component differs, where this is now j omega sub d1 
and this is whoops let me call that one and let me call this one two and if somebody now says oh they have now specified the peak time that tells us now where we need to live in the imaginary component of that complex pole or if somebody now says what's the relationship they could say omega sub d2 produces a blank system or a blank peak time than omega sub d1 or what I'm saying in parentheses is t sub p sub 2 is something t sub p sub 1. So let's leave out the parenthetical comment to begin with. Omega sub d sub 2 produces a blank system than omega sub d sub 1. This is now concerned with peak time. How quickly do we reach the peak? How fast do we get to that peak and then we start settling? Omega sub d sub 2, and here's our relationship between peak time and the damped frequency. Omega sub d sub 2, <laughs> omega sub d sub 2 produces a faster or slower system than omega sub d sub 1. It's further, or it's bigger, so that now makes our system faster, or it re produces a smaller peak time, so that now time to peak is actually less for theta omega sub d sub 2 than omega sub d sub 1. Now you should have all of these locations interconnected in the S-plane in your head. Settling time, percent overshoot, and peak time. Now what we want to do is translate those into Z-plane locations or geometric shapes. And here we're just a little bit late because we should have been doing this in the middle of February. Because one of those shapes it's kind of a heart if you use your imagination. Oh, So we're going to be talking about heart shapes, we're going to be talking about circles, and we're going to be talking about wedges. This could be a breakfast commercial. Hearts, shapes, and not clovers. But we just missed that one too, didn't we? But we don't have a clover, we have a heart. A heart, a web, a wedge, and a circle. Those are the shapes that we're looking to uncover now in the Z plane. So let's now translate these performance specifications into Z plane pole locations. And what do you think we're going to do or use to make that connection? What relationship have we already been using, are we familiar with, so far in this class? The advance or the delay relationship on Z. Or now we can say that Z is equal to E to the ST when, let's say, S is minus sigma plus j omega sub d. 
so that now we can say, oh, z is equal to e to the minus sigma plus j omega sub d times t. Or we can write that another way in terms of not sigma and omega sub d. This is the rectangular way of writing those pole locations. We could op also op write those in terms of omega sub n and the damping ratio. Or you could say that this is now e to the minus zeta omega sub n, that's the minus sigma, plus j omega sub n square root of 1 minus zeta squared, there's omega sub d times t. However you want to write it. But now we want to use that notation to try to understand what z might look like. Or, here is now our sigma, and this is omega sub d. So that z is now, if we distribute that t in, through those two component parts in the exponent and separate the exponent into two, a product of two terms, we can now write that as e to the minus zeta omega sub n t e to the j omega sub n t square root of 1 minus zeta squared. There's our sigma, and these two pieces together give us our damped frequency of oscillation. And what we want to see now is that z could be written as a magnitude r at, and now we'll call this theta sub dt, I'm sorry, this we're going to call omega sub dt, which we will now call theta sub d, and don't confuse that with the theta that we had in our complex s plane. That's now the theta sub d in the discrete or z plane. This is now equal to some r e to the j omega sub dt or r e to the j theta sub d. Which particular structure we use may depend on what we're trying to learn from this relationship of settling time, percent overshoot, and peak time. We could also write this, if we have it in polar form, we could also write it in terms of r and theta sub d in rectangular form by just in applying Euler. Z now could also be written as r cosine of theta sub d plus j r sine of theta sub d. That's just using Euler, or we now have it in rectangular form. And if somebody needed to put a, a diagram in your mind, here's the Z plane. This is the second complex plane that we've been playing with. There is our pole, and we would obviously have its conjugate. And we might now want to know how far away are we from the origin, that's the r, at what angle, that's theta sub d. And now we could find our x distance, let's say x bar is r cosine of theta sub d, and our y distance, let's call it y bar, is r sine 
theta sub d. We can now think about these points, these two poles in the z-plane in terms of r, theta sub d, zeta, omega sub n, sigma, omega sub d, etc. So now let's start making those connections. Let's start with the first specification that we did a minute ago, which was the 1% settling time. And the 1% settling time in the S plane corresponded to what? What was the 1% settling time location or was it an angle? Was it a horizontal line? Was it a vertical line? What corresponded or was connected to the 1% settling time in the S plane? Yes, a vertical line. And how far that vertical line was into the left half plane determined how fast our system responded. Suppose that the blue line we say is a distance sigma sub 1 away and the red line, those are supposed to be vertical, is sigma sub 2. If we now map those vertical lines through the relationship of z is equal to e to the st into the z plane, what do those vertical lines map into? And now to get you thinking, let's just go back to something that we've already talked about. Where did the imaginary axis in the S-plane map in the Z-plane? Here's the real part of Z. Here's the imaginary part of Z. Where did the imaginary axis, if I now started walking up the imaginary axis in the S-plane and somebody says, oh, but now transform that walk through z is equal to e to the st, where would I be walking in the z-plane? No clue? Oh. Where's the frequency response in the S-plane? That's the imaginary axis. Where's the frequency response in the Z-plane? That's the unit circle. If I'm now walking up the imaginary axis in the S-plane, I'm consistently walking now around the unit circle in the Z-plane. What am I trying to make us think? When we see vertical lines in the S-plane, think circles in the Z-plane. If we now move further into the left half S-plane, and you want me to draw a blue circle in the Z-plane, now I'm replacing S with sigma sub 1, which it's really e to the, or S is minus sigma 1, so that now what color am I? I need to be blue. Let's say that this, oh, yeah, let's just make it, that's a circle. Sorry. <coughs> Getting frustrated. You can get your compass and sketch a better circle, but I guess if I were to do some guides, <laughs> 
Suppose that's now my circle associated with sigma 1, and I'm going to say that's a, a distance away from the origin in the z-plane of r sub 1, which is now e to the minus sigma 1 t. Now if I draw the circle associated with sigma sub 2, is that going to be outside or inside r sub 1? So now r, capital R sub 2 is e to the minus sigma sub 2 t. t is the same. Sigma 1 and sigma 2 are sized or their relationship is drawn already in the s plane. Sigma sub 2 is bigger than sigma sub 1, so where's the circle in the z plane? Where's the red circle? Are we ready to get out our pillow and just dream of Goldilocks or try to find the most comfortable pillow? That one's too hard. That one's too soft. Oh, there's a pillow of paper. Okay. Somebody in my office hours today was talking about paper that she had that was better than the paper I had. Oh, hurt. We're not talking about hearts just yet. We're talking about circles, so I won't worry about my heart just yet, but where's the red circle? Bigger or smaller? Just plugging in some numbers we can see now, and I'm sure this won't be, but it's hopefully representative of what I'm trying to describe. Here, r sub 2 is e to the minus sigma sub 2 t, and now if we wanted a faster system, we're thinking of making these circles concentric and it's going closer and closer to the origin. These concentric circles, or a bullseye, we now can think of, we now have R1 is equal to e to the minus sigma 1 t. R sub 2 is now e to the minus sigma sub 2 t. And we could think in the z-plane of a bullseye or concentric circles. And if somebody says, well, what's a smaller circle correspond to? a slower or faster system, a smaller circle. I hope I just told you. That should be corresponding to a faster system. So that here, R sub 2 is less than R sub 1 r sub 2 is faster, that's closer to the origin in the complex z plane. Which circle, if I had two poles and one pole was on r1 and another pole was on r sub 2 and let's say they were real, which of those poles would dominate the response if they were both in my system? R1 or R2? Which would dominate? The slower one, R sub 1. I don't know why I threw that fly in the ointment because I'm not wanting you to get confused. I want it to be very clear. But now, if somebody now wanted to say, oh, somebody now has given me a settling time They've specified T settle. Now what image or shape comes into your head? If somebody now gives you a settling time, what shape in the Z plane should you be thinking? Circle. So now if somebody gives you a settling time, you're worried about a circle and you want to know 
how big or small is that circle and that circle is going to be influenced by whatever they tell you they want to achieve with their settling time. So if you're given a settling time, you can find the radius of this circle. Suppose that we say let T settle. That's a given length of time in, let's say, seconds. Well, we could also specify that in terms of the number of sample periods that it takes to reach that absolute time in T settle, or we can describe that as some integer multiple of the sample period, T. N sub S is now the number of sample periods in our settling time specifications, where this integer N sub S is T settle divided by t. And we can now translate that into what we've already talked about. We know that for a single pole system that has a pole at a distance r from the origin, its behavior it's going to settle, if it starts at x sub 0, it's going to settle according to this settling time in r, I'm sorry, in n sub s steps, so we've now multiplied r together n sub s times. That's how it collapses to obtain our 1 percent, where this is now 0 0.01 x of 0. Those two cancel and we can now say that r n sub s is equal to 0 0.01. This is now our 1% settling time relationship or equation. Relating our radius to this time length, t settle. If we solve that for r or n sub s, we can now interrelate those. Suppose we take the log base 10 of both sides. We now have n sub s log base 10 of r is equal to log base 10 of 0 0.01. And what's the log base 10 of 0 0.01? What's the log of 1? What's the log of 10? What's the log of 100? Now we're going in the opposite direction. Now log of 0.1 minus 1. This is now minus 2. Or we could now say that the log base 10 of r is minus 2 over n sub s. And now we'll use that equation star to either solve for r or n sub s, the number of sample periods to settle or the radius based on how fast we want to settle. If we now raise both sides or Yes, raise both sides to the 10. So you, now we say r is equal to 10 to the minus 2 over n sub s. What if, for example, somebody said n sub s is 60 samples? They want to settle, reach a 1% settling time in 60 second, in 60 samples. Then what's the radius going to be? 
r is now 10 to the minus 2 over 60 or 1 over 10 to the 1 over 30. And what is that? Or what is 10 raised to the 1 over 30? What's 10 to the 0? 1. So 10 to anything positive is bigger than 1. So this is going to be something 1 divided by a number bigger than 1. This is going to be a little bit bigger than or a little bit less than 1. And in fact, it's 0.926. So if somebody wanted to settle in 60 sample samples, I haven't even specified the sample period. So the absolute settling time is still yet to be determined. But if you wanted to settle to 1%, you would want your poles to be a distance of 0.926 away from the origin. We'll pick up with the other shapes. I know you're dying to see the wedges and the hearts next time.